Welcome to Wiggly Wigglers, the podcast from the Wiggly sitting room in Lower Blayton Farm, Herefordshire. I'm Heather from Wiggly Wigglers and I'm joined today by Richard <laughs> from Wiggly Wigglers <laughs> and we've got the pleasure of Alison's company. Yippee. Hello both. We have cut her out a bit lately, haven't we? Yeah, no, Alison's been, oh. uh, she's been chomping at the bit to get up back on the opposite side in the wiggly sitting room. She keeps sitting on the stairs, waiting to come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and every yeah. week, we've got something even more exciting than Alison. <laughs> yeah, so there oh. I'm left on the stairs, yeah. thinking, hmm, they invite me in in a minute, and I just go back to my computer and answer the phone. Oh. <laughs> It's quite oh, sad, it's isn't it? Yeah, we've had plant of the week hasn't hasn't really sort of materialised as being well, sort of more of the week. a non plant important of the decade. fact, I <laughs> guess. <laughs> we like plants of the week though. Yeah. And this week we're actually going to talk about purple loose strife. That's which it, I yeah. put in our book as one of my utter, utter favourites. Yeah, it's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. And actually it's something that really stands out. I've noticed them more, I think, since you know, I've been here and and Wigglies has been selling them because you go down the river and you kind of see purple loose strife everywhere. This year, when I've been fishing on the river, I've seen them dotted about and they they really stand out and they're a superb looking plant. See, that's what happens. You let him go and he mentions sales. You're not allowed <laughs> to mention sales. Okay, okay, no sales. So, Al, are they kind of easy to propagate, purple loose strife? Oh, they're fairly easy. They can be liable to take over, so it's no good for a small pond, but um, a larger pond is excellent for. Right. And there's a lot around here growing on the sides of the River Wye. Yeah, seen lots, it when you're fishing them. But it's quite easily confused with Rose Bay Willow Herb uh, that you're talking about. A lot yeah. of people confuse it with Rose Bay Willow Herb. But it does grow quite tall. It's up to, like, two, two and a half metres high and it, it does reproduce seed quite rapidly. Yeah. So if you don't want to grow too much of it, you want to be cutting it down harsh before it goes to seed. Otherwise, um, it can take over a small area. Right. But it does look um, lovely in a mass of it, doesn't it? And you see it along the river. Gorgeous. So. And we've got some around the Wiggly Pond. And for all our US listeners, I bet they are now shouting at their radio again, <laughs> because in the US it's actually taken over a bit. Really? And it's the Plant Conservation Alliance's Alien Plant Working Group Least <laughs> Wanted Plant. Really? Yeah. yeah, Least Wanted. Oh, wow. That's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. But here it's not taken over and it's the most gorgeous wetland plant, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's absolutely lovely. In the old days, it's used to treat cholera in the 19th century and also for repelling flies and gnats. So that'd be a good one for around here, wouldn't it? We've got loads of flies around here. Really? Repelling flies yeah, and gnats? Yeah, flies and gnats, making ointments out of it and things. Ah. Have you yeah. knocked some up for us to try today? No, but I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of gnats. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, you get a whole bunch of... It's really good for insects, though, isn't it? It's quite rich in pollen. I know when you look at purple loose drive, the always hoverflies buzzing around. Yeah, there's loads yeah, of it. Yeah. And apparently it's good for the small elephant hawk moth, which feeds on the leaves of this plant. Really? Yeah. Right, there you are. When do we plant purple loose dry fowl? Um, you can plant all year round. Obviously, um, during the hot months, um, it's not very advisable. It's grown, this work particular one's grown in boggy sites or in shallow water or on a pond edge. And you need to really cut this one back harsh in the autumn. So it grows up from the base again come spring. And oh it looks right. lovely. Yeah, you get fresh I don't growth. Know if I did yeah. that last year then. Didn't what you? happens if you don't then? I mean, you need fresh growth coming up from the bottom really, otherwise it goes to look very old, like an old shrub. Oh, you know? I see. Yeah. Now then, this brings me to rain gardening because we were asked last week about rain gardening. Could one use purple loose drive in one's rain garden? Yeah, you could certainly use it in a rain garden because it likes the boggy site, so when it rains, that's fine. But also because it's a native plant, should that site become dry, because, you know, we've hardly had any rain in Herefordshire at the moment, it is tolerant of um, the dry conditions, but as soon as it rains again, it'll, it'll perk up. So, yeah, it'd be ideal. We should explain what rain gardening is. So over to our expert, Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Rain I'm, not, I'm definitely not an expert, but my interpretation of rain gardening is that it's um, a way of landscaping a garden to be able to accommodate the runoff from the roofs of your home rather than letting all the rain either go down into the sewerage or alternatively hit the hard landscaping around the house and run down the roads and whatnot and end up in the sewers again. So it's more it's a question of creating a space where you have a deeper area where the, the runoff can collect and drain naturally through the soil. So, practically speaking, it's a place where when you've got your downspout, you've, you've made a small basin that maybe has a retaining wall 
that you plant native plants into and importantly you have a mulch on top. That's right, it's something like that or a bigger space, just a whole garden, but the whole garden has been designed so that it's lower in the middle than it is around the outside. Yeah. So that when you do have runoff, the water tends to run down towards the centre of the garden rather than running off and being lost through surface drains and whatnot. And then if it does then percolate out, it's cleaned. Yeah, well, it's, it's going through the soil, so it's a natural process of the microflora and fauna in the soil being able to deal with the toxins and the suspended sediments that gather in rainwater. Wow. Amazing. What he really means is that worms eat it and then it comes out the other end clean. Certainly they're going to be part of that cleaning process, yeah. I think it's really cool because listening to the Tim Smith interview last week where he said they don't actually promote what to do at Eden but they kind of give you the philosophy. Mm. To me, this is a real practical. You can do this. It's completely easy. It's really simple. And it makes it's a such cinch. a difference. It's a cinch. I mean, rain gardens, I think sometimes people think, oh, rain garden, is that like a sort of tropical rainforest where you have to water the garden all the time? But the idea is it works opposite to that. So the rain garden is something that accommodates the rainfall and that you try to incorporate flowers in that can deal with the environment. Mm without having to put tons of water in there unnecessarily and unnaturally. So what sort of plants could we use besides purple loosestrife? All sorts of native plants. I mean, you could even enhance it with um, wildflowers and rushes and reeds and things. Even, you don't have to make it a massive area. I mean, I've heard of ones where you can just build like a little wall or a surround around trees and things so that it just waters you know, that tree is... And you think, I mean, you know, rain butts this year have really taken off the sails because of this people being scared that they're not going to be able to or afford to be able to use as much water as they'd like for their main supply to water their garden. But it's really so straightforward to be able to get piping from your downpipes from the house and direct them into your garden space so that your garden benefits from any water that we do get. Because, you know, those roof spaces, sometimes their surface area is pretty large and you can get a lot of water and you'll be able to harvest that water. And, and then water becomes, through the eye of the person collecting it, as important as it really is. Because if you speak to someone, say, that comes from the outback in Australia that spent their life growing up and been in these ridiculously arid, hellish conditions where water is so precious to them, and they come over here and they're completely amazed on how we waste our water. And because our climate is changing, it's so important that we treat water with kind of more respect than we currently do, you know, pouring gallons onto cars every, every Sunday. And, you know, it's kind of obscene, isn't it, really? Let me just take that soapbox from under your feet and I'll just put it out the door, <laughs> Rich. Yeah. <laughs> but he is right, isn't he? Yeah. He is right, yeah. Uh, but I, I, my passion is, you know, why are we growing plants? that actually need all this water, isn't it better grow these native plants that can stand all the differences in our climate much more easily? You know, I can't be bothered to go and water the garden. What? what? Water a hanging basket? No thanks, chubby. <laughs> 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 it's funny how uh, people have, a, have an environment and they want to change it. You know, they either want to change it to, if they have a kind of limey soil, they have to get ericaceous compost in to yeah. grow uh, acid-loving plants. You know, they want rhododendrons because they've got limey soil. Well, isn't that slightly obscene? If you've got limey soil, then there's a whole world of plants that really love limey soil, so grow those. I can't get him off his soapbox, <laughs> but I can't wait to make a rain garden. You know, I know that, you know, we're not in an urban area here, so there isn't the level of pollution. But the idea of making something that retains water, that yeah. then uses the runoff off your house. Oh, well, in many respects, there is, there's a massive cool. rain garden here because there's a little pond out there, that natural cirque, that uh, collects uh, all the water that runs off the farmyard before it drains down into one of the mears and ends up in the wise. So whilst there's not many plants in there, it's a good little filtration pond. Mm. And that works on a, a large scale, really. Al, anything to add? Yeah, I'd just like to say that because we've had absolutely no rain, it oh, looks yeah, like so a desert gorgeous. around here, but it's an ideal time now that if we, we all had rain gardens because the runoff, it would be massive now because the ground is so rock hard, yeah. Yeah. Um, it just run off. I mean, people say, oh, it's going to rain soon, but we have to have an awful lot of rain for it to be able to soak in because the top layer has gone into a pan. So it'd just be a complete runoff. So a rain garden is in Herefordshire. Be like, hey, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely something worth looking at. And uh, certainly, if you, live, if you live in an urban area, then a rain garden is the way to go. Yeah. If you want more information, email 
richard at wigglywigglers.co.uk or heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk or give us a ring. We've got this 0800 number, 0800 216 990. And if you're from other parts of the world, plus 44 391. There's the music, 11 minutes in, Rich. Right. We have actually forgotten one essential thing. Uh, the introduction. Yes, I'll do it. We'll pretend that we were supposed to do it now and Michael can just edit it out. Fine. So, on this week's show, uh, we've had Alison. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about rain gardening, which was exciting, so that's yeah. why we've actually done that. Right. And we've got Alan Pottinger coming in, who is Jenny Steele's husband right. and he's a beekeeper. And we've got Toast in, who, if you hear any scratching, she's got an itchy back today. And we're waiting to see if she is cooking croutons. Oh, right. Do you think there's a chance? Well, she's had a husband. Yeah. And they have met under favourable circumstances. Right, right. So we're waiting to see. Ah, she's see. looking fairly portly. She is, yeah, but... she is. But it might be because of <laughs> too many sandwich scraps and things, though. Yeah. She's taken up raisins. She keeps no. going to Noel and going, getting eating raisins. raisins. No, it's not good. No, no. So welcome, Alan. Hello. And Farmer Phil's in. Hi. And before we go to bees, which is what we really want to hear about, I just thought I would ask you what you think of the new clog box. God, that's an interesting movement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a strange-looking thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's a strange-looking thing. It's your nose in it, Phil. I would say okay. unique is a better word well, appropriate, for it. Appropriate, really. I yeah. must tell you the story of what this clog box is and how it came to be. Mm. On an earlier podcast, Wiggly Wigglers went to Holland to find out all about worms. And when we were in Holland, we met up with a clog maker called Peter. And he hand-makes his clogs and he dries his willow and it was all wonderful. And we looked at the toe of the clog and we thought, that's a really cool shape. If we turn it up that way, we could turn it into this wonderful looking bird box. And so <laughs> here it is, <laughs> like magic. Isn't that nice to have a sound effect? Yeah, that an email was, coming that, in. It was, that was perfect timing. <laughs> so what do you think? I think they're great. Yeah, I mean, I think they are a unique design. They're very, very interesting. It's very distinctive. Uh, I would definitely want to use one of these myself. I, I think, think the fact that it's made of willow is a positive thing because willow is quite weather resistant in itself, being a semi hardwood. So I think that's good. And the shape is, I've never seen anything like it, except obviously on the bottom of a Dutchman's foot. <laughs> Alan, you've put up loads of bird boxes. Is it practical? I would say definitely yes. It's a nice size and shape. I think it's very natural looking. The hole's great. And I think the inside size is definitely large enough. So I would certainly be uh, interested in having a couple of free samples. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Rich, give him his tenor. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you <laughs> naughty like man, you mustn't be so positive. What about the bad points? I can't really see anything that is bad. I, I, I do think this has been... Uh, <laughs> I've lost my will to live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest. I mean, I would love to come up, like, come up with some bad, I, bad points about it, but it's actually really good. I do Why like it. Why is the top flat rather than having a bit of a slope to encourage the rain, rain to, to run, run off? It's probably because you'd lose that much more space inside the clog. I think the fact is all wooden boxes have only got a few years' life in them, i found, certainly. So the fact that the top might rot eventually, I don't think is a problem. Yeah. He certainly had other products outside all year round for years, yeah. and they look okay. I think you just have to accept that you might have to replace the top at some point. So you're off then? Where, I, where are you off to? I am going to put the toast on because it's tasty time. <laughs> Tasting time, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're going to taste almond honey, and I've got different sorts to taste, so... I'm going to make a toast with butter with Alan's honey so you can do the Alan interview about bees. And don't forget to ask about beeswax. Right, OK. So, off I go. See you in a bit. And See you in a bit. Place. 
Yeah. It's interesting, Alan, a while ago. Uh, see you in a minute, see you in a minute. We, we were talking about bees, because uh, I've got a neighbour that offered me some hives. Right. And, and you said you should take, you take them up on the offer and get the hives. They're really expensive and it's relatively easy to get a, a swarm of bees. How, how long have you been beekeeping? Probably about four or five years now. And you, you obviously find it quite rewarding. Yes, I mean, it is very rewarding. It's good fun. You get a lot of honey and it's, it's really quite easy to do. Is it really quite easy to do? Because I imagine people, you know, most people have visions of big swarms of stinging insects hovering around their pride and joy and going to be sort of t- taking your life in your hands every time. It can be, it can be. And this is one of the problems that a lot of beekeepers have when they first start because a swarm quite often has a queen, obviously, that you don't know about its quality. And because the worker's temperament is dependent upon that of of the queen, if you don't know what the queen's like, you don't really know what the swarm is going to be like. So it's much better, if you can, to try and start off with a queen that's bred and that you know is going to produce high-quality workers with a very calm temperament. And then you don't run into those problems, which are, I think, probably... How do you do that, though? How do you vet the the temperament of the queen? (laughs) Well, it's best to get it from either somebody that you know who's been breeding queens or from a, a company that do breed queens. So okay. I've just done that myself. Right. My bees were getting a little bit uh, aggressive. So I requeened this year with two very calm queens and I was looking at them yesterday and I really didn't need any equipment on at all. They were so calm. Really? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, 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 that's pretty amazing stuff. I mean, in a natural situation, you have the hive. So if you had a wild swarm, sometimes towards the end of the year or middle of the summer, you end up in a situation where bees swarm. Now, is that because a new queen is born to the hive and she's taking away some of the workers? Well, actually, what happens is earlier on in the year they swarm. Actually, later in the year they don't tend to. And what happens is that a population will decide that their queen is worn out. And so they will allow eggs to develop into a new queen and you can only have one queen in the hive so the old one will leave and take about half the workers with her and that's what's called a swarm so in the hive that's left the new queen will develop and will create her own workers right that's interesting does that in any way affect the production of honey it does actually because half the workers go it pretty much puts the kibosh on any further honey production that year but it doesn't actually affect the quality of the honey so the bees that are left do actually still continue but the overall production is a little bit lower okay bees are obviously incredibly important at pollinating flowers aren't they uh, you know lots of orchard owners horticulturists yeah. have their beehives in and their, crops in their orchard and crops yeah mm. yes yeah, certainly and People often will introduce colonies to pollinate certain types of flowers. Mm -hmm. So presumably, if a bee is harvesting pollen and nectar from certain species of flowers, then does that have an effect on the type of honey that they produce? Yeah, absolutely. So the commonest example of that is when rape comes out. And because it's so prevalent over the countryside, beekeepers can produce a lot of rape honey. Um, And it can be a problem because it crystallises so quickly in the hive. But it produces very nice tasting honey. But you're right, for all sorts of crops, bees will be used for pollination. And the type of honey that's produced and the taste of honey is totally dependent upon what they've been pollinating and feeding on. It does make a difference. I, I remember Sarah and I went to Corsica last year. And there was a guy at a market and he was selling all sorts of different types of honey and we tried them. And a couple of their types of honey, it was the most disgusting <laughs> stuff you've ever tasted in your life. But by contrast, the, is it Manuka honey? Is it yeah. Manuka honey? In New Zealand that I've tried, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I mean, from your experience, presumably you're able to see what types of plants those bees are foraging from. Which, which is the best type of honey? Well, I think it's widely felt that the best honey in Britain is from heather. Right. But it's actually very difficult to know what your uh, bees are foraging on. When there's a lot of rape around, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. But when the rape's not there, then they could be feeding on a whole load of different things. And in my last garden, we had a very wide range of garden plants, and it produced a very rich flavoured honey. Right, okay. So the toast that Heather is busily preparing for us to lace this beautiful honey on that you brought in today, where, so you, you've got, you, the, this honey has been produced in your garden. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but you've had to kind of newly establish a lot of plants, haven't you? You've, you've been landscaping your garden. We have, yes. So it's largely from the countryside. Right. So some of it is from the rape crop, yeah. but other honey is from uh, wildflowers in the hedgerows, and blossom from the local trees. Excellent. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking forward to this with bated <laughs> breath. But I'm just wondering, Phil, I mean, 
There is a situation in this country now where I think honeybees are suffering from various plagues and whatnot, aren't they? Well, there's one particular problem, which is the Varroa mite, which has been sweeping through from the south for the last 10 years or so. And it, it's something that most beekeepers are able to keep some degree of control uh, with. But the problem is now a lot of the mites are becoming resistant to the chemical treatments. Right, right. So there has to be more of an integrated pest control. For you, Phil, as a predominantly an arable farmer, I mean, what kind of impact if bee populations really suffered? Bees are absolutely critical to some crops. As you know, some crops, most cereal crops, are self-pollinating so that they don't need a bee to transfer pollen from one plant to another. Other plants that need to cross-pollinate, and they include clovers and beans notably, you have to have things like bees to actually get the cross-pollination, which leads to the seed forming right, and right. so that they're crucial and obviously the most efficient bees are the ones that are the honey bees you know bumblebees will do it but because they're not as efficient and not they don't go at it as as well as honey bees do no, no. The, it's honey, numbers, and what we would usually do is to get the local beekeeper to put some hives in the field right well i remember when we first started growing rape years ago we don't actually grow rape now but all the beekeepers were up in arms because their honey was concrete hard right and i was going to ask alan <laughs> how you process the honey makes quite a lot of difference doesn't it because you mentioned that the rape honey crystallizes very quickly in the hive but i'm under the impression that you've worked out how to process rape honey so that you can get it so you can actually spread it well there are really two ways of doing that phil the first is to make sure that you harvest it very quickly because it doesn't crystallise immediately. It will uh, do so over a couple of weeks period. So if you can do that in time, right on cue, okay, the honey is arriving, then that's fine. The other way is just to slowly heat up the frames once you've uh, got them and they are crystallised because you simply cannot extract them through the normal methods, which is to spin the frames and get them out by centrifugal force. Certainly, right. when we've grown clover crops for seed, the beekeeper's given us some honey from that. Clover honey is just gorgeous. Yeah. It's great. Fantastic. Here we are, then. Hey. So hey, you're back. You're back with all sorts of goodies. One thing we didn't ask about, Heather, is your little wax question. Oh, typical. I thought we'd leave, it, leave that for you. Well, I want to know about beeswax. You know, oh. where, where is it in the hive and what do you do with it? Well, the wax is created by the bees to create their comb where the honey is stored. So there's a lot of wax in any hive and you can extract it either through the little bits that come off when you're harvesting or through just taking old frames that aren't full of honey and melting them down. And so do they need it for anything? Yeah, they absolutely do need it. For them it's the structure within which they store the honey. But of course they overproduce the honey which is the way we've bred them. So once you've extracted it, then you are left with a frame of beeswax. And so have you brought any? I would love to say that I have, and it's in my back pocket, but no. <laughs> Do you use it? No, I don't, because I tend to use all the frames I've got. Right. I think if you've got more hives than I've got, and I've just got three, then quite often you have extra frames around. But I prefer focusing on the honey than on the beeswax. Yeah. Right, here we go, look. Looking good. I've got Alan's runny honey. Right. Kind of see-through honey. Alan's stodgy honey. And manuka honey. Oh, right. Oh, okay. well done. OK, yeah. this is posh honey, isn't it? Very expensive, yes. I expect you've already explained why the colour differences are here. Have you? Well, we've talked a little bit about the granulation, but it's very much dependent upon what they're feeding on and some honeys will turn from the very liquid state when you extract them into the more solid or creamy state quite quickly. Right. Are we going to butter our own? Oh. I think we could. <laughs> How are you doing it, Matt? I was, I was thinking that um, Alan was saying that the temperament of a hive is dependent <clears throat> upon the queen. Yeah. I, I can see parallels in our daily lives there, Rich, Absolutely, you? yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> it, a, it does. Just a cotton dump Although on a minute. Although I that, you're, you're very calm, Phil. <laughs> well, I, I have to say that the Queen seems fairly calm <laughs> this morning. I have been called Queen Worm before. Yeah, yeah. Well, the parallels between 
obese society and human society are definitely very strong, and I think probably nowhere stronger than in Wiggly Wiggler society, <laughs> where the hive is run by the queen bee, who we can perhaps call Heather in this instance, <laughs> surrounded by lots of female workers who uh, work their socks off, <laughs> and then the occasional male worker who just sits around and does nothing. <laughs> Yes, we, were, we were talking <laughs> earlier about when we yeah. decide, yeah. and it is us, the rest of us, who decide when the Queen has had it and we want a fresh one, a younger model. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, <laughs> how do we do that? The trouble is she'll take half the workers with her and then you'll be really stuck. Yeah, but if we get to choose which half... <laughs> that's worth some thought for <laughs> But sometimes yeah. the new queen battles with the old one. Really? She's fight to the death. Oh, really? heck. Yeah, right. That's interesting. It's okay because I'm yet to peak. Right. My peak year is 46. So they can't get rid of me yet. A year off then. <laughs> you <laughs> cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you cheeky yeah, well, monkey. And then we've had worse than. Earlier <laughs> <laughs> on. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we got if we all get buttered and then we just stopped the tape and well I spilt the honey all over the table. Sorry <laughs> about that everyone. <laughs> and that was the runny honey. Yeah, <laughs> it is runny. Um, but we're gonna get toasting to clear that up. But we've now all buttered up and we're going to try the different types of honey. <laughs> So, Alan, where should we start? Well, why don't we start with the creamy honey, which is made from, from the rape. Mm. Mm. Now, a lot of people say they don't particularly like this, but I think it's mainly beekeepers because it is a hassle to, to work. Personally, I think it's got a lovely taste. I like that. Mm. It's very fresh mm -hmm. tasting. Sort of sharpie, like candy. Hint of early spring days. Hint of early Did Julie Golden sneak in beside me while I was <laughs> Will you be commenting on hints of coffee and aftertastes? And I think that's top honey, I like that. I'm not sure Slimy. where that went. I, I like kind of it. like it, but it's got a, a, a bit of a twang to it. So yeah. slightly, a slight after, it's not exactly an aftertaste, it's sort of an in-between taste, but I'm not, kind of, I'm not convinced. It is very nice, certainly, but <laughs> I've already sneaked a preview. I don't want to steal Alan's fire, so, so where are we, which direction are we heading now, Alan? Well, I was just going to say, forget about that free jar that I brought you. <laughs> <laughs> so runny next, is it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, runny next. Hang on, then. Runny honey. Mm, that's mellower. I thought you said that they would probably taste the same, but we were supposed to say they were different. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not the same, are they? Well, how would you describe that one? Rounder. Right. I reckon. Round up. <laughs> <laughs> that's my sort of honey. <laughs> that's glyphosate, Phil. So I had a little hint of, oh. uh, of round <laughs> <laughs> Rounder. Rounder. Mm. You know, more... More blended. The, yeah. More blended. And, and it, it, what is interesting then, well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? If it was kind it of, would, yes, of from a range of, of different, different things, yeah. Mm. I much prefer that. That's much nicer. It's kind of earthier, but it doesn't have a bite. There's no bitterness, you know. It's much more subtle, sweet. It's e definitely easier on the palate for me. I like them both. It's all right, Heather, you've you got, got the free jar. Though, yeah. Right? <laughs> Let's see what New Zealand's best can do for us. So what's, what, what is special about Manuka honey? I mean, it's certainly special in terms of price. Well, it comes from the other side of the world, which I think is a black mark against it, but it is supposed to have some beneficial health properties over and above the beneficial health properties of honey anyway. But whether that's true or not... I'm not so sure. Mm. I think that's beautiful. It's, it's got a slightly deeper flavour, hasn't it? I prefer the runnier one. 
yours, your runny one is beautiful. It's just got that kind of perfect blend. Manuka's beautiful, and I prefer that to the one from the rape. But it's um, it's a bit stronger, isn't it? The flavour's stronger. Can we have a chocolate rating on honey? What do you think? I mean, what, the Manuka, I haven't tried the Manuka one. Um, what do you reckon to it? <clears throat> Well, I think I don't like the taste as much because I know it's from the other side of the world, so that right. puts me off it okay. a bit. Yeah. And I prefer the stodgy Allen honey. So the rape, the rape honey. What about you, Phil? It's your fave. I, I like the texture of the stodgy honey, and I really like it, but I like the taste of the runny honey. But what I really Stod. like is that the local honeys are all different, and whether it's the crops that they've come from or the person who's made them, or the different area and so on, so that these are from Shropshire. We've got all sort of comparable ones in Herefordshire. And I love the fact that you can have a bit like wines, any number of different tastes and textures from your own region. Yeah. And yeah. whilst the Manuka is fine, it doesn't excite me. I mean, it's, it's lovely honey. Mm. But I like the story that goes with the other. The yeah, fact sure. that, you know, it, you know where it came from, you know what, and, it, and it's probably unique that... 10 miles down the road, it'll taste differently. Mm. Right, Alan's chocolate rating on Manuka honey. Just to remind the listener, from one to five, one is Hershey's. Yuck! Two is Nestle. Three is Cadbury's. Four is Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and five is Milka. Mm. Mm. Manuka. I would give Manuka a three. Mm. Rich, Richard? Well, as you know, I don't really agree with your chocolate rating because I'd swap them around a little bit. Oh, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I think Manuka's a four out of five. Look, can you please play the game? In this, That's galaxy. In this field, <laughs> it's definitely a galaxy. Yeah, very tasty. I've got to agree with Rich. I think it, taste and texture alone, it's got to be a galaxy. Mm. Well, I'm giving it a Hershey's because the thing is, <laughs> it's flown from the other side of the world and what's the point when we've got wonderful honey here? Mm. So oh, well, it's a Hershey's have... for yeah. me. I thought and we were moving on. on. Taste, taste. There's a lot of basis of flavour and texture rather than the kind. No, OK. OK, right. so All now we're on tip. Alan's runny honey. Alan, we'll, we'll let you rate it yourself because you're going to compare it nicely. Well, I, I actually do agree with the other comments of the, all the honey that um, we produce. That's the nicest, so that would be uh, Milka. A milker. If you could say with a little bit more passion. That would be a milker. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo, That's runny honey. That's definitely a five out of five, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a green and blacks. <laughs> <laughs> Philip? I'd like to say that I think is a, a don't drop it again. No. <laughs> I'd like to say that, that I think that's a milker. And I'd also like it taken into consideration that I stole half a bar of milka chocolate last night after oh. you got to bed. Oh, um, good dear, dear. Dear. Alan's stodgy honey. First of all, I'd say I object to the word stodgy yeah. when used with honey. <laughs> it's very healthy and it gives the wrong impression. It is right. creamy. I would give that a slightly lower rating than the other ones, which would make it a yeah. galaxy. Richard? Oh, yeah, I think it's a lesser, a lesser specimen than a galaxy. I, I, I'm kind of hovering between a, a two and a three, so between a sort of Nestle and a Cadbury, I think. Phil? I like it, but not as much as the Runny, so it's got to be a galaxy for me. And, of course, you've forgotten to ask me, so I'm going for the stodgy, or now the creamy, um, being the milker and the runny being the galaxy. Thank you very much, team. Gosh, there you are. I bet all those listeners are sitting there going, oh, I really wish I had some honey. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Anyway, tough. <laughs> right, let's clean up then. And just before we go, thank you for our latest review on iTunes. If you've got the chance to go to iTunes and review us, we would be eternally grateful as long as you give us five stars. Oh, only joking. But if you go to iTunes, that would be great. What's coming up next week? What is coming up next week? Who knows? So we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.